Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Sander Mark. Uh, I work with uh, Picnic Technologies. We're an online grocery scale-up in the Netherlands. So I'll, I'll get back to that a little bit more into the talk. Um, but other than that, before joining Picnic, I was in IT consultancy for over a decade. I've done Java development, software architecture, lots of other things. All to say that I've seen a few things in terms of software development. And if you do this for, for a while, um, then you might start wondering, what is it actually that we do? What is sort of the nature of our craft, of our business? At least I started wondering that. Maybe you, you do too. Um, at least probably now you do. Um, but that's sort of what triggered this talk. Because I think it's fairly standard for us to call ourselves software engineers. But I'm wondering how correct is this is actually. So let's do a quick poll before we get started. Um, raise your hand if you're a software developer. All right, almost all of you, great audience. Keep your hand raised. Keep your hand raised if you call yourself software engineer. Wow, almost all of you, brave, very cool. Now, I think there's a lot of things to, to talk about in, in that area, and, and we're going to do that. And my goal here is not to convince you that you cannot call yourself a software engineer. It's all fine by me. But I do think there's a few things in our craft, in our work that we do, that are not as engineering focused as we might think it is. So I hope that this talk will give you some food for thought. Um, maybe you start calling yourself software developer rather than software engineer after this. That's all, all OK. Um, but let's, let's try to find out what it is that we do day to day. So software engineer, engineering. Of course, engineering goes back way before we started uh, this thing called software development and started calling ourselves software engineers, right? So we had civil engineers, chemical engineers, uh, aerospace, ele um, uh, uh, electrical engineers, and all of these fields, they're sort of applied science when you think about it. They take this vast body of knowledge, some of which goes back hundreds of years, which has been well-tested, codified, um, and they apply this to, uh, uh, to tackle technical challenges, create things in the real world, and use technology uh, as a force of good. And I'd like to think that we do the same. We also use technology, but are we actually engineers? Um, I think there's one really big difference between all of the engineering disciplines that I talked about and software development, and that is accountability. Let me ask you this question. Have you ever been asked or have you ever signed off on a piece of code certifying that it is bug-free? Raise your hand if you have. Wow, one. Uh, that's brave, because I would never sign such a document. And Continue on that, have you ever been sued for this? Have you ever been held really accountable for the lines of code that you've written? I don't think for a lot of us that, that doesn't hold. For many of the other engineering disciplines that I talked about, this does hold. There's a lot of regulation, there's a lot of uh, historical precedents on why there's so much accountability for these engineering disciplines that it actually means something to call yourself an engineer. And a lot of this thinking was tr actually triggered by this article that I read a while ago. Um, there's in Canada, a regulator that said, please stop calling yourself software engineers, please. Um, that you can write a few lines of HTML, it does not make you an engineer. And there was a lot of discussion, people were up in arms because of course companies want to hire software engineers and advertise for that, etc. cetera. Um, but if you read this article, it's actually quite interesting what it says. It says, professional engineers are held to high professional and ethical standards and work in the public interest, it said. The public places a high degree of trust in the profession, and these layers of accountability, there's the word again, and transparency help keep Canadians safe. Wow. When you read that, you want to be an engineer, right? But the article was actually about how we cannot call ourselves software engineers, because, well, we don't really, really live up to this. So that's the thing. Now, what if we turn it around? What if engineering were more like software development? Because we can play this two ways, of course. Let's say uh, one engineer comes to another engineer and says, let's build a bridge, right? That's also sort of the level of requirements that we usually get, so let's roll with this. Um, then, of course, the engineer in typical software development style says, sure, I'll give you a man for P in, in two sprints, right? Um, well, maybe uh, you won't even say two sprints because it's done when it's done, right? Uh, but anyway, we, we all know how this ends. This ends in misery, right? This will not end in a bridge which you want to cross. Um, you simply cannot iterate your way to a bridge. 
there's a vast body again of, of knowledge, of science, of rules, of regulations that all need to be taken into, into account. You do not start building a bridge from scratch and just iterate with a small scrum team. So that, that way also doesn't work. So maybe we should think more of science, right? Because we also have science. We have computer science. So are we then maybe more computer scientists? I think this is a good question to ask. Um, and, and I love computer science. I studied it. I think a lot of you also did before becoming a software developer. And it's almost a little bit like mathematics, right? There's these eternal truths in there. There are the very neat abstractions, the very uh, math-based and math-inspired kind of approach to, uh, to uh, computers. Um, I think it's uh, fair to say that we do have quite a lot of knowledge in there. But how much of this do we actually use day to day? I would say we do use a lot of output from uh, computer science. We use compilers, we use all kinds of tools, data structures, etc. Um, but maybe we're not really practicing computer science that much in the work that we do. So talking about data structures, um, we, we, we learn in computer science about many of them, graphs, uh, trees. We learn, uh, for example, very important facts about trees, that they cannot have cycles. Uh, until your product owner comes to you, shows you this picture and says, well, actually, trees can have cycles, so please go fix it. Um, so there's, there's a lot of things here, and maybe this is the wrong example. Maybe we should talk about another concept that translates to the real world. Um, let's talk about, for example, uh, recursion. And we all know that to understand recursion, you must first understand recursion. I'm going to assume that you have to part down, because otherwise we will never finish. So let's assume that you have. Um, another concept, uh, super important to understand and, and to apply in the real world. Uh, take, for example, this article. Um, Hitman hires Hitman. Who hires Hitman? Who hires Hitman? Who hires Hitman? Who tells police? It's got everything, right? It's got the suspense, it's got the drama, it's got the recursion, it's got the base case, and the base case here is this uh, final Hitman saying, well, this is not enough money, I'm not going to do it, I'm just going to turn us all in. Um, so again, yes, um, uh, recursion, and uh, there's lots of concepts that we might use or recognize or apply, but I think it's fair to say that most of us in our day-to-day -day work, we're not acting as computer scientists, we're not creating novel alg algorithms, we're not um, doing complexity uh, research, etc. Um, so, some of you might work in academia, that is different of course, you're working on important things like uh, proving P is MP, or maybe P is not MP, not sure what to root for nowadays. Uh, but usually, as software developers, the closest we come to doing computer science is when we need a new job. Sad but true, right? So, in a sense, uh, computer science is essential to what we do, but it's mostly the output of computer science that we use in our day-to-day -day work, um, rather than uh, being actual computer scientists, I would say. So, maybe not completely software engineers, maybe not completely computer scientists. What is it then? I would say we are actually problem solvers. And software development is our tool to solve problems in a certain domain. So the domain should always be central to what we do. And this can be very diverse, right? We, we, we could be in an e-commerce domain, we could be in a financial domain, we could be in uh, factory automation, uh, it can also be very technical domains, but in the end, there's problems in the real world that we want to solve, and we do this using software. Now, the typical thinking here is that, okay, yes, we have a domain, and then we add on this computer science and software engineering knowledge, and then we get great software. Right? Mm, not so sure. Because in the end, um, if this were true, we wouldn't have these projects that overrun, that are late. We wouldn't have high-profile outages, even by Google and Datadog and Facebook, etc. Uh, things would be uh, probably a bit more predictable, and it would be easier to create great software. So that's where I think a lot of the art of software development comes in. I think if we look deeply to what we do and, and what it is that we do, that even though we might not really like it, there's still a lot of intuition involved here, and a lot of art and craft, and things that are not easily captured in the, in the computer science books, and that are not easily captured in sort of uh, regulations and so on. And I think that this, this art of software development is actually bigger than we give it credit for. And that's why, what I want to explore uh, during this talk. So, congratulations! You're actually an artist, right? If you look at it this way. You can create stuff from nothing, you are given many opportunities to shape the world around you in ways that people cannot imagine using software, using the tools that we have. 
effectively giving you infinite possibilities. And I think this is really, if you let it sink in, makes us much cooler than engineers, I would say, right? So we have so many possibilities and so many things that we can do. And I'm not the only one who thinks this. I, I ran across this quote by John Romero from ID Software, who's the creator of Doom. Um, and he actually says, uh, you might not think that programmers are artists, but programming is an extremely creative profession. It's logic-based creativity. And I really love this term. I really love this quote, right? This tension between logic and the math and the computer science, but also the creativity that comes with our work and the, the novel approaches that we're taking and the software that we're building when we are doing things that have never been done before. So I know it's not all rosy and we're not always creating new things from scratch and changing the worlds. And, and sometimes we are practicing the dark art of copy-paste driven development, right? Guilty as charged. Um, but overall, I would say uh, our, 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 our uh, jobs transcend uh, this uh, copy-paste driven development and are about creating new things where um, the IDE is our canvas and code is our planes with which we can create things that were not there before. And sometimes people uh, hear this and, and discussion and they, they come up to me and say, well, Sander, you're making me a bit sad because now you're making me sound like an amateur, right? Um, I'm an artist? Why? That sounds amateurish. To which I say, do you think artists are amateurs? These people, they are dedicated to their craft. They hone it in every way. The works that they make, they're not just there for the sake of it, some is, but a lot of it is commissioned, it has a purpose, and it actually affects change in the world if you look around you. And of course, art could also be mixed with amateurs. Remember this one, right? So I guess there's a little bit to this. But overall, art uh, does not mean amateurism. So let's get that out of the way. So if I were to summarize what we do as software developers in one single word, to me, it would be abstraction. And I mean that we look at something that happens in the real world and we want to make it better. We want to, make, we want to automate it. We want to be uh, the, the agents of change there. And looking, for example, at what we do at Picnic, uh, as I mentioned, we're an online grocery scale-up. So our mission is to make online grocery shopping as easy, fun, and affordable as possible for everyone. Now, sounds easy, but if you look at everything that needs to happen for an order to be placed and fulfilled and to end up at your doorstep with these cute electric vehicles the next day, it takes a lot of software, right? So we need to do all of our warehouse management, purchase orders, make sure that the app runs. There's so many codes and so much code involved here. And actually, our developers, I view them as the artists that look at this real world problem and abstract. They find the right parts to abstract away because you cannot automate every little detail that you see. So it takes skill, it takes real vision to take a problem and turn it into great and working software. Now, this is not just about code. The software development lifecycle goes much further than that. It's about coding, also about testing, uh, design, and the process around this. And I think in each of these areas, we can see a little bit of this, this art of software development. So I want to look at these areas uh, in, in, in turn. So let's first look at code. Most important, of course, because code, in the end, it's the truth. You can have the best process or the best design, but if your code doesn't work, <laughs> then you have nothing. So we want to write good code as artists, as uh, performers of the art of software development. But what is good code? So here we have uh, the Mona Lisa, uh, widely regarded as one of the most beautiful paintings by, uh, by Le Leonardo da Vinci. And you can ask your question, what, what does this make, 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 what makes this a good picture, right? What makes it beautiful? Is it the, the haunting eyes or the elusive smile, the use of color? And it's a little bit of everything, but you can also analyze this a bit further. Uh, who knows this one, for example? It's the golden ratio, right? And it doesn't mean that every piece of art needs to follow the golden ratio, but if you look at a lot of pleasing pictures and nice art, you see this principle coming back as something that is applied to a great effect to, to make beautiful things. So then you start wondering, is there also a golden ratio of code? And what are the principles of, of good code? Is it something like uh, this? <laughs> Obviously, it's very aesthetically pleasing to see uh, a street fighter like <laughs> indenting your code. Um, all very nice. Uh, but of course, this is horrible, right? So th this is not something that we, uh, we should strive for. And 
I'm very happy that we were getting Java 21 so we can get out of callback hell and we get Loom, etc. But that's beside the point. What I want to say here is that the art of software development is not about our source code and the layout of our source code. You can get very cute, uh, I know. Uh, this is actually a, a submission to the International Obfuscated C Contest. Looks super nice, it actually runs. But our source code should not be the object of our art. It should not be a snowflake that we tend to and that nobody can touch and that we should make beautiful, etc. It's just a means to an end. I would say there's a lot of beauty actually in uniformity when it comes to source code and code itself. So I would highly recommend you, if you don't do this yet, to actually automate all of this uh, uh, craft away and use one of these tools, Spotless or Google Java Format or the Format and Maven plugin, to actually do this as part of your build, as your CI, so that you don't have to think about this anymore. You will have a uniform, beautiful and nice code base. We use Google Java formats, but any of the other tools uh, work, uh, work equally well. But back again to, to, to uh, what is good code. Uh, back to Mona Lisa. So there's actually a story behind this painting. And this story starts with uh, a guy called uh, Francesco del Giacondo uh, in Italy. And you have to remember, this is before Instagram. So he wanted a very nice picture of his wife. And as you do in these times, you go to a painter and you commission a work to be made. And Leonardo was this painter. So there's a very clear reason why, why Leo started painting this picture. It wasn't because he wanted to practice his golden ratio or any other things. No, he just got paid to actually, write, uh, uh, to actually uh, paint this painting. Um, now, all said and done, <laughs> he actually created this painting and did not sell it to Francesco, but to some French king who outbid him. Um, so, uh, I'm not sure if I would recommend that. Uh, but anyway, there's, there's a clear reason why this painting exists. And I think the same holds for good code. You should have a very good reason for every line of code in your code base to exist. And this sounds very obvious, like the code should solve a real problem, etc. But I can guarantee you, if you take this principle to heart when reviewing pull requests, when, when looking at code, then you will have a completely different way of, of reviewing. And you will not spot the nitty gritty details, hopefully some of the formatting that we talked about you already automated away, but you will focus much more on are we abstracting the right things, are we finding the right abstractions, are we solving the real problem that we see in the world. Remember, this is electric vehicle that I showed and the, the painter that look, looks at it. That is our job. That is a very creative job because there's no uh, rule book on how to approach this and it will be different in, in a lot of different contexts. Slightly less context sensitive is caring about the quality of our code. Of course, we know that writing code is cool, uh, but it will be read much more often than you, know, you write code. So keeping this in mind, making sure that the quality of your code is attended to, and we'll talk a little bit more about what that means, um, is, is one of the other things that is part of the art of writing good code. Finally, um, context is king. So we all um, rather dislike the new people who join our team and start saying, we need to do everything differently, right? And open the pull requests uh, to, to make big changes. No, good code actually fits into its context. And of course, the context may change over time, and that's fine, you can have a good discussion around that. But code, should, it doesn't stand on its own. And the context can also be quite different in different domains, in different industries, right? What is good code in game development is quite different from what is good code in enterprise microservices development, which again is quite different from what good code is in, in uh, factory automation, PLC code, etc. So again, there's no single hard and fast rule. There's a lot of context here. So the first and the last one, they are very context dependent. It's good to think about how this applies to your context, but let's zoom a little bit more in on quality uh, as a more generic concept here. So we all know that a lot has been written about uh, writing uh, high quality code. So there's, uh, there's these books, Clean Code is uh, probably the most well-known one. Um, and when you read these books, there's a lot of good stuff in there. Let me put that first out there. But it also shows that at least we're very good at uh, creating acronyms as, uh, as developers. And um, you likely know a lot of these. But these books don't really tell you where and when and how to apply these principles. They're sort of sold to us as universally good. But actually there's always, again, the context and the time and the place for where and when to apply these principles. And there's even tension between some of these principles, right? If you want to keep things simple, sometimes it's better to copy and modify 
rather than to abstract too early and uh, apply the don't repeat yourself principle too rigorously. There's also uh, quite some tension between some of the other principles here. So I think a lot of the, the art of software development is actually understanding this and gaining this experience and having this intuition for when and why and how to apply these principles rather than just knowing about them, reading them and applying them either blindly or maybe even for forgetting about them. So there's, there's a lot of um, understanding in here that that's art and the art of software development hopefully brings you. And what I'm getting at here is that software development, if we view more as an art, it also means that you can have sort of a style. And I don't mean a personal style, I mean you as a team or as a company. You need to think about what you feel is good code and what makes the art of software development work within the context of your team or your company. And then when you have that, you try to engineer it away as much as possible. So a few examples. So I always get pretty sad when on pull requests I see these kind of comments, right? So can we add a space after if, or uh, how about using optional is empty instead of not optional is present? I mean, it's not wrong. It's just not talking about the real important stuff as we discussed, right? This is not about are we solving the problem in the right way? Are we solving the right problem? Are we finding the right abstractions? So it's not bad to have these discussions, but it's bad if you have them over and over and over again. You lose so much time, you lose so much headspace on things that are really important. So what do you mean, do I mean by engineering this away? Well, there's a wider range of tools uh, that can help you in improving the quality of your code on these kind of topics. So there's Spotbox, uh, ArchUnit, and, and uh, SonarCube to actually uh, see these kind of issues, flag them automatically. There's even a class of tools like error-prone and open rewrites that go a step further and actually rewrite the code for you so that you can do this automatically, and that's in every PR this can be done uh, for you, uh, which takes away a lot of the toil and discussions and helps you, hopefully, to focus on the real art of solving the problem that you need to solve with the code that you're writing. So just to give a little example, uh, we use error-prone within Picnic quite heavily, and uh, such a discussion about optional is empty versus optional is present, um, if we were to spot something like that a couple of times, we would have a good discussion around this as a team, as a company, settle on one desired outcome, and then an error prone, uh, create this so-called uh, um, template, where you can say, well, anytime you now see in our code base, this invocation of not optional is empty, automatically rewrite it to optional is present. No discussions, no problems, everything is nice and uniform, and we've discussed this, we know why we, uh, we can now forget about it and focus on the real things again. And you can do this for a lot of things, and it's not just error prone, again, there's this arch unit, there's uh, open rewrite, there's many other tools that, uh, that can help here. If you want to know more about this, uh, last year at DevOps I had a talk uh, more about error prone and how you can do this, uh, highly recommend it if you want to go deeper into to that to watch the, uh, the recording on uh, YouTube there. Now, the risk here is that we start obsessing and focusing on tools. And I want to sort of get away from that, right? These tools are important, uh, and there's many more choices that you will make as a software developer uh, around tools, around technologies, etc. But in the end, they should all serve the same purpose. And the purpose is actually solving a problem in a domain, being a problem solver, um, and, and, and performing your, uh, your, your work as well as you can as, a, as an artist, as a craftsman. So can you imagine what would happen if, if uh, painters approach this sort of as software developers, where they started discussing around all the tools that they use, etc. No, it's really about, um, even if you have a great technique, it's really about the work that you create. And if that doesn't fit, then, then something is wrong. So, um, actually, um, Vincent van Gogh uh, lived uh, roughly in this year, and uh, it's, it's, it's uh, striking that, uh, uh, well, as we saw, um, Francesco was before Instagram, uh, but Reddit was around, actually, when, uh, when Vincent van Gogh uh, was alive. So uh, there's this uh, painting subreddit. And imagine that uh, van Gogh would go on there and say, hey, guys, I need some advice on which brush to use for my next masterpiece. Any recommendations? And then, of course, uh, Monet is on there as well and says, van Gogh, seriously, your paintings look like a chaotic mess. Fine brushes provide the finesse and control needed for true artistry. And then he responds, and notice that he doesn't really understand threading, but anyway. Um, I find fine brushes so boring, I like to use a fan brush to create interesting textures. And then along comes Renard, he says, fan brushes are overrated, blah, 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 blah. This is the bike shedding effect in action, right? So 
focus on tools and you will never get anything done. Use your tools effectively and you'll create great work. So a good craftsman, a good software artist, it, you will not blame your tools. You will not obsess over them. You will use them to their best effect. You will use it to automate your style as much as possible, but then it will allow you to focus on the more uh, important things on the bigger picture. If you want to read more into this, um, there's this very interesting uh, presentation uh, also listed out on the boringtechnology.club website. I can highly recommend looking at that, and uh, hopefully you will refrain from doing resume-driven development after you've, uh, after you've looked a bit more into this, because it is uh, definitely something that uh, we might fall uh, prone to every now and then. And in the end, it's also good to remember that even though uh, we care a lot about code, um, your users really don't, right? In the end, your users they value uh, what you deliver. And of course, as artists, as craftsmen, we know that we need to care about the quality of our code, because ultimately, if we don't, then uh, we cannot deliver this value anymore. So this sort of catch-22, this, this cycle, that is also something that we, as software developers, need to be very mindful of, and is definitely part of the art of software development, I would say. So that's about code. Let's talk a little bit about testing as well. Now. Uh, a lot of people think that the goal of testing is to prove that something works, the system works, which obviously uh, cannot be the case, right? We, we, we cannot prove this through testing. So in the end, testing is much more about finding creative ways to break shit, um, which is also very, very nice. Uh, I think uh, I know a lot of testers who are good at this. Um, so that's, uh, that's good. Um, and I especially love when they do sort of this exploratory testing, right? They just mesh around in the application, try to find ways to break it, and then when it happens, they take a screenshot, and then they uh, actually uh, make you fix it. That's great. Uh, but of course, we are developers, so we're not going to uh, talk about exploratory testing, but I want to talk a bit about unit testing, which hopefully, as developers, we do a lot. So like we could ask this question of what is good code, we can also ask the question, what makes a good test? Um, and I hope that if you look at a typical unit test, that this is not too controver controversial in the sense that um, there's this pattern of arrange, act, assert that most good tests hopefully follow. But of course, there's much more uh, uh, to the discussion in the details. So a good test should, of course, assert an outcome. Otherwise, you're not really testing anything. You're just running some code. But the big question then becomes, should we have one uh, assertion in our unit test? Uh, should we have multiple? And I know there's different camps, there's different styles. Um, should we use J unit assertions, assert J? Um, a lot of good discussions can be had around this. But again, this is an engineering kind of discussion. So automate this away as much as possible. If you settle on the fact that you want to have one assertion per test, make sure that you enforce it. If you want to uh, 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 sort of unify on assert J rather than J unit uh, rules uh, and assertions, then enforce it. Again, use one of the tools that I talked about earlier to engineer this all away. It gets more interesting the higher you get up in the stack of a test, right? So our test is not just there to prevent regressions, but hopefully while writing a test, you're actually also driving the design of the code that you're testing, right? If you're doing more or less test-driven development, this should happen. And then you get to very interesting questions like, am I actually over-constraining my solution by writing this test? Am I imposing too many restrictions here? Or have we even covered enough with the tests? And again, it's not as easy as going for 100% coverage. We all know that, right? That, that doesn't have to mean anything. So here we're getting more to the territory of, of intuition, experience, the art of software development also on the testing side. And of course, we want our tests to be understandable and maintainable. So even higher up in the test when we are uh, doing the arranging, so preparing all the data, making everything uh, ready for the test. We have questions like, should we mock, should we not mock? Um, should we share data between tests? Um, and I was actually in a talk uh, by Victor and Thea before this around uh, microservices testing. And the trade-offs, they're quite different between different uh, architectural and, and implementation styles that you have. So again, um, here we are approaching, I would say, much more the art of software development. These are not things that you can easily automate away. Um, so that's something that's, uh, that where I feel we, we can add a lot of value as, uh, as software developers. Now let's talk a little bit about design, one of the other uh, big parts, hopefully, of any software development cycle. But there's a big question mark here, because I think a lot of people think doing design upfront might be over-engineering, right? 
And I do understand the feeling where this come from, comes from. So, uh, of course, uh, under the term software architecture, a lot of bad things have happened. I present to you uh, early 21st century uh, recognizable box and arrow style software architecture diagrams. Uh, this is not really what I mean. Um, so yes, there might be prior art which tells you don't over-engineer. That's good. But at the same time, Martin Fowler already in 2004 wrote this article called Is Design Dead? Uh, this was during the rise of XP and Agile and everything that was happening there, um, where, where people were much more, okay, let's just iterate and let's just build, and we don't need this uh, design up front. And, and spoiler alert, uh, his answer to the question, uh, is design dead, is, is no. And, and that's also my answer, right? Because we still need to make sure that we, that we build the right thing, that we avoid costly mistakes, because the later we make the, those mistakes in the cycle, uh, once it's out there, it's, it's become increasingly harder and more expensive uh, to fix. Doing design up front also helps you uncover risks and assumptions about the approach that you're taking, about the technologies that you're using. Um, and last but certainly not least, it also helps you if you have documentation about your design and your architecture, uh, not just for you and for uh, future you, uh, but also for people who are onboarding. There's just all kinds of reasons why having at least some design uh, for your systems and the features that you're building is really helpful. So, put it another way, uh, weeks of coding can save you hours of designing. So, if you want to dive more into this, uh, there's this talk by uh, Simon Brown, who's also at this conference uh, right now, um, called The Lost Art of Software Design. You can see how I like this title. Um, it goes much deeper into uh, why maybe we went a bit too far with avoiding design. Uh, and uh, if you uh, watch this talk, I think you can get a lot out of this. But, but most software developers find this part of software development actually a bit daunting, right? So how can you create a good design? What, what is a good software design? Um, and why is it so daunting? Well, unlike with development, where we have a compiler that yells at us if we're doing something wrong, an IDE to help us, to guide the way, um, we don't have this during design, right? It's much more up to us to, to uh, actually come up with creative ideas, to write them down, um, to make all the trade-offs, and trust me, it's always trade-offs. There's never one perfect uh, solution or one perfect approach when you think about software design and software architecture. And it really requires you to truly understand the problem before you can even make a meaningful design, which uh, you might skirt a little bit if you just start developing and incrementally start trying things. And ultimately, design is also very much communication, right? Like I mentioned, to, to future you, but also to new people, other people around you. And communication means that well, design is, is talking with other people, and people are hard, ergo, uh, design is hard. So that's, that's, that's definitely a feeling I can recognize. So I want to highlight one sort of driving force that hopefully you can apply when you approach and when you do software design, which is um, to simplify. And if you uh, know this quote uh, by Pascal, he says, uh, if I had more time, I would have written a shorter letter. We can also translate this a little bit to, to software design and software architecture, where we would say, if only I had more time, I would have created a simpler architecture, right? Said no software developer ever. <laughs> we, we love our complexity. We, we love adding stuff. We love creating bigger and more complex designs, solving bigger problems, et cetera, et cetera. But at some point, this, this just breaks and it, it won't work anymore. So we need to simplify. We need to somehow do that. And when thinking about this, I started wondering why is it this way? Why, why do we prefer the complexity? Why do we prefer growing this complexity all, uh, all over? And then I ran across this very interesting article in Nature, uh, which says, this was not about software, by the way, just this is a general problem-solving study, where they say, people actually prefer to add elements to a solution to solve a problem, rather than to take away elements to solve the problem. Which is really interesting, right? And you see this here, they had this sort of Lego study where people needed to make a stable structure, and there's one um, block there in the corner, and people just started adding three other blocks, and then it's stable, but of course, it would be much easier if you just take away the single block there in the corner. Um, so, I think this is sort of a bias that we're also prone to when doing software development. It's very easy to think about new things to add, uh, new technologies to introduce, uh, new complexity to add to a system, but it's much harder to identify how we can cut down something to make it comply with our new requirements or our new ideas. But it's very much possible to solve a lot of problems by actually maybe taking a little bit away here and extending a little bit there. But 
somehow we don't do this, or we, we miss this when looking at problems. And I think looking at this as maybe a sculptor, as the art of uh, creating nice statues, really helps here, right? Because in the end, it says already there, uh, perfection is actually achieved when there's nothing left to take away, uh, which I think is a very nice approach also when talking about software design. So keep this hack in mind and hope it helps you. As we design software, I already mentioned, it's also a very large part of communication. You will have to share what you think with others and you will need to build consensus. And I think we can learn a lot there from the art of storytelling. So there also, it is very important that you take complex ideas, that you structure them in such a way that you can, in, pers in a persuasive manner, also uh, tell others about this. Um, even use visualization. So of course, for software design, this would be diagrams. Um, so when creating design documents or RFCs or, or architectural des decision records, um, it helps to think like a storyteller. So you're not just stating bland facts, but you're actually trying to take others along and help them overcome their objections. And in a sort of a narrative way, um, make sure that the design that you have in mind is also communicated to other people. Now, of course, that does assume that you have a design or that there's something there. Um, for this, there's, a, uh, of course, domain-driven design approach, event storming, there's, there's lots of others. But in the end, it's not about uh, these techniques, it's about the outcome and how you communicate it. And interestingly, within Picnic, uh, we started also running into yeah, uh, issues with this because it's hard. And one of the things that we did there is introduce a way to actually deliberately practice with this. And that's really hard because usually there's a lot of pressure on designs and needs to be perfect at the right time, etc. So we actually uh, designed a workshop where together um, and with people from the development team, we actually take a bit of time to, to learn this and do this for a fictional feature where several teams together create an RFC for the same fictional feature. And then we start looking at, but why did you make a choice and how does it compare to the other approach? And this is super useful to actually sharpen your skill as a software designer and to, to master this art as well. Can highly recommend. All right, so we've seen codes, testing, design, but there's also this thing called process, of course, also known as, is it done yet? So um, as developers, um, something we might not influence too directly, but we do suffer or benefit from good process, of course. Now, it might seem that this is a solved problem. If you look at some of the ISO publications around software development life cycles, et cetera, there's a lot of uh, words uh, being uh, uh, written about this, but that's all just illusion of control. We know it doesn't work if you have this big overarching approach. Um, it's even very expensive document. Uh, I wouldn't buy it uh, because already the summary is quite bad. So we already know that, that Agile effectively is nature's way of telling us that software development isn't strictly, strictly engineering that we can control in this top-down fashion, but we also need to have the room to iterate and to try and to uh, uh, incrementally get better. But of course, there's a very big spectrum of Agile, right? So there's the spec by Slack approach, as I would call it, where you just start uh, responding to uh, random uh, comments from your PO over Slack and then just uh, take it from there, uh, all the way to the sort of scrum fall approach where we say we're doing scrum, but we're actually doing big quarterly, yearly plannings and then uh, very much in a waterfall fashion. So I think you're all now expecting me to come up with this perfect analogy to, to art and solve this for you, but I'm afraid there's no silver bullet here, right? So process, uh, in a sense, it is, it is a hard nut to crack, and um, I don't have any uh, perfect solutions. But we can maybe turn this a little bit around and say, rather than focus too much on the process, what we can do together already tomorrow is not focus so much maybe on the process, but focus on the team and the interactions and the way we work together. Because that is something that we can hopefully influence. And I think there's a couple of things that we can do as, as software developers to, uh, to actually increase our effectiveness as a team and also make sure that we, we deliver what we want to deliver. And this is really about being very explicit in your expectations, both towards the team, but also to the outside world, uh, and doing this hopefully also with, with some empathy, right? So it is not just about um, uh, cold hard facts, but this is actually, uh, uh, we're, we're all people. We're all trying to get better at our craft. We're all trying to deliver value. So let's do this in an explicit but emp uh, empathetic way. There's also this, this notion of autonomy, right? So we all love to have sort of autonomy and autonomous teams, which I think is a good thing to strive for. But in the end, it really comes down to trust. So can you actually gain enough trust with your team to, 
to do the things in the way that you want to do them. But conversely, do you also give trust to others? Which also means that they can fail, right? And you need to deal with that and you need to be okay with that. But if you can do this, if you can provide this trust, you will also gain more trust and together be able to function. And in the end, I think learning and continuous learning and sort of the curiosity of a team uh, will really drive the, uh, the, the outcome and the quality uh, very much. I would say you may not be able to influence your process too much, but a great team can actually uh, evolve good processes and maybe even survive bad ones. Um, but if it doesn't sit right at the team level already, then you can even have a perfect process around it. It will not really help you. So if there's, if there's any book that you want to read around sort of software development processes, don't focus on Scrum, don't focus on other process books. Read Peopleware. Become good at crafting teams that, that gel together and that actually want to work together because they want to get better at their craft. They want to um, yeah, earn and, and give trust to each other. So you might wonder, all sounds great, but how do we learn this stuff? Because apparently this is something that uh, doesn't directly come from your, your computer science education or any uh, regulators, etc. So, so how do we learn this stuff? Is this just experience or, or, or what, what do we have here? So some translate this as a question of getting the right knowledge. So who has these books on the shelf? A uh, few hands. Keep your hand raised if you read them. I haven't. Only part. Wow, one brave soul. Very good. Even if you read this uh, cover to cover, you will not be a good software developer. You will be very smart. You can create great al algorithms, but you will not be able to be a problem solver in the domain. Because there's, there's more than books, right? It's also about our skills, about our craft. So I'm Dutch. Um, I ride a bike. People who don't and want to learn it, they might find this. I'm going to guarantee you, you won't learn to ride a bike from a book. This is an actual book, by the way. I was this close to buying it because I want to see what is in there. What does it say? Just get on, pedal, try not to fall. I don't know. Um, but in the end, uh, we, we all know uh, you won't learn this from a book. And maybe you say, well, maybe not this sort of dummy book. Maybe we need something more rigorous, to which I give you this this. Great article, it's 15K words on the physics of bikes and everything that you wanted to know about how a bike works. But even reading this 15K words, it will not make you a cyclist, right? For that, you just gotta get up, you gotta fall, you gotta try again, and you gotta get better uh, incrementally. And I think a lot of elements in, in software development are also a little bit like this. Not all of them, but some are. And there's this term that I encountered called mitis that, that sort of covers what I, wanna, what, I, what I mean here. And apparently this is a Greek word that translates to something like wisdom, skill, or craft. And I actually encountered this in a book called uh, Seeing Like a State, which is totally not software development related, related, but it's a great book anyway. And it says about me this, it resists simplification into deductive principles which can successfully be transmitted through book learning because the environments in which it is exercised are so complex and non-repeatable that formal procedures are impossible to apply. Well, I think that perfectly describes our wild world of software development, right? Requirements change all the time. Uh, we can definitely talk about complex environments in terms of all the technologies and the, the, the things that we're using. So we need a lot of medis in our work. So how do we get this? I think a very overlooked um, approach to this is actually something that the old masters, the old artists did. They formed guilds together. They actually had master and apprentice uh, kind of relationships. And that's how uh, Van Gogh and Rembrandt and all the great masters actually learned their skill, got their work. So I think this is something that we can emphasize more as an industry. And one way we do this within Picnic is uh, by, by trying to create an environment where we can create these sort of master-apprentice relationships. So what we did is we introduced uh, what we call a tech academy, where we take people who studied computer science and, and hire them right out of uh, university. They join the team immediately, so they can be useful from the start, but they also get half of their time actually to uh, acquaint themselves to get this meetis that we talked about. So they are uh, contributing for 50%, they're learning and growing for the other 50% of the time. And why can they do this? Because we have a dedicated mentor for them, sort of the master-apprentice relationship in action. 
And that proves to be super effective. And of course, we also have some training, some courses, and access to other online content that, that helps them. But I think the key element here is this relation between a very experienced engineer taking a very young, inexperienced, but super enthusiastic engineer under their wing and building up this sort of craft, the, the art of software development, the things that you will not learn when you read the books and when you only look at, uh, at sort of hard cold facts. So that, that works really well for us. And I think in general, what you can, can do here is Depends a little bit on where you are in your journey, of course. But on the one hand, you can find a mentor if you if you are this person and you want to get better at this, or be a mentor if you are this experienced developer and, and want to also bring this craft, bring the art of software development to other people. And this can be within your com company, um, but it could also be in, in, in your community, right? So uh, either Java user groups or, or, or other communities. It doesn't have to be strictly only here in, in, a, in a company that you work uh, in. All right. Looking back a, li a little bit, um, if we are artists, uh, then I would say real artists leave a legacy. So that should also hold for us. Which means that I want to urge you to think about, are you actually working on something that matters to you? Because we have this, this, this art, this true craft, where we can create things from nothing, we can affect change in the world, but are we using this? And sometimes you need a little wake-up call, actually. And, and if you need that, then consider this your wake-up call, right? Think about it. Am I actually working on something where my skills are contributing to something that, that is meaningful to me? So you can shape the world with your talents. And it's this craftsmanship. In the end, yes, large part of this can be engineered away. And there's a lot of tools that can help you with that. And it's great to look at this. But don't lose, uh, don't, don't, don't lose sight of the big picture, right? Don't focus just on tools, just on technology. In the end, we are problem solvers. We are here to make a difference in the domain that we're in. And software is our way of doing that, um, but hopefully uh, we, we can transcend just being technologists and actually solve problems. And then the sharing and mentoring, I think, is the key part to make this also something for other people to grow into. Because in the end, you can make a difference in a lot of lives of other developers. There's this um, discussion a lot of times about uh, the 10x developers, right? So we need to hire this, this, this unicorn, this, this person who's 10 times as productive as someone else. I think it's a bit of a toxic discussion, but I think a better way of being a 10x developer is actually, over the course of your career, mentor 10 other be developers. And if they only increase their effectiveness with maybe 10%, well then, to me, you are a 10x developer already, but in a much more healthy and much more sane way. And hopefully, uh, unlike some of the, uh, the great masters that we uh, talked about in this, uh, in this talk, we will get some recognition before we die, but who knows. All right, that's it. Thank you so much for joining me. If you want to read more about how at Picnic we apply uh, the art of software development, uh, I can highly recommend going to our engineering blog. And uh, with that, I want to say, go forth and write some beautiful code. Thank you.